The connection between Roosevelt House and the Declaration is this is where Eleanor first realized she had to be her own person and that she had to develop her own political networks as FDR began to grapple um, with the unacknowledged realization that he would never walk again. You will never hear him say that publicly. But at Roosevelt House is where he really understood this. And the, his soul battle, if you will, between Roosevelt House and Hyde Park and Warm Springs in Georgia is where he put all of the parts of FDR together. It was here that FDR was the New York Paul and the social dandy. It was at Warm Springs that he realized the pernicious effects of poverty and the struggle that it would take to get his legs back and the heartfelt bond that he created with fellow polio patients regardless of their income, education level, or status. But Eleanor supported his decision to give this house to Hunter College full throttle. And when they first gave it to Hunter, and I say this as a segue into Eleanor's role on crafting the declaration, she wanted it to be used for a multi-faith interfaith council. And why was that important to her? This was a woman whose view of faith was profoundly ecumenical. And the war changed her in ways that, um, unless you've been in combat or in the hearts of a refugee camp or in the throes of an ac uh, epidemic, it's hard for us to understand. She, um, when she went to the Pacific, which she was able to do in 1943 after she was blamed for a race riot in the United States, she wrote to Truda Lash, the war fills me with the greatest sense of dread that I, the greatest sense of responsibility that I dread that I will never be able to discharge. She carried a prayer with her in her wallet that initially she cut out of a magazine and then she rewrote and rewrote and rewrote. And unlike popular culture that says it's the St. Francis of Assisi prayer, it was a very different prayer. It was, dear Lord, lest I continue in my complacent ways, help me to remember that somewhere someone died for me today. And if there be war, help me to remember to ask and to answer, am I worth dying for? So on the horrors of the Great Depression, and remember that Eleanor Roosevelt went everywhere without secret service, unguarded, including into coal mines, which was a taboo in the mid-1930s. And in fact, when she comes out of the coal mine, you have that extraordinary New Yorker cover, right? Well, that, I mean, cartoon, but that's really a very sanitized version of that cartoon. When that cartoon first came out, it was Eleanor Roosevelt with soot on her face. And there was an extra line under, oh my God, it's Mrs. Roosevelt. It's no, it's not, it's a fill in the blank. So she's learning the hardships and the, the peril that economic and social degradation bring to people's courage to dream and without dreams, she believes, you can't build a better world. And so how does this relate to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Well, in eight minutes, um, I want you to envision this. 
Eleanor Roosevelt had four years of education. I'm not talking college. I'm not talking graduate school. I'm not talking law school. I'm talking four years of education. She was conversant with all the religions of the world. She read widely, and she taught herself six languages. She did not want to go to the UN. And in fact, she was appointed to the UN in December of 1945 because she had be begun her full throttle assault on Harry Truman for not being able to lead in times of crisis. Because Truman does not become give him hell Harry until 47 and 48. And so Truman turns to Jimmy Burns um, from South Carolina, who had been on the Supreme Court, who left to help Truman, to say, my God, what can I do to get her off my back? And he thinks, let's send her to the UN. You know, she can, she, you can get the Roosevelt stardust, you know, and for sending her over. And my God, she can't cause any trouble. She's not a lawyer. Well, <laughs> so when the call initially comes to her, she does not want to go for all of the reasons that I've just said. It's her secretary and longtime assistant, Tommy Thompson, who says to her, are you flipping kidding? This is a lead to speak. You know, you know all the leaders of the world. You've spent three weeks in combat. You've blown out your eardrum. You've ruined your feet, you know, so that you cannot walk without special shoes. You're in trenches. You're in submarine warfare. You're in unpressurized cabins. You have been to refugee camps all over the world. You have seen poverty. You've seen World War I. You've seen World War II. What is wrong with you? So she calls the president back, and she accepts. So she accepts her role, really. She thinks her role is going to be a figurehead. And then John Foster Dulles and William Vandenberg come to her on the Queen Elizabeth and say, Mrs. Roosevelt, we have decided that you should be on committee three. And Eleanor, who is dutifully reading through all the briefing books, hadn't made it to committee three yet. And so she doesn't want to blow it. And so she says, her first response, she writes, is that why did they pick my assignment when all of the boys get, that's her words, get to pick theirs? And so she goes back, she reads everything, and committee three, as every person in this room knows, is the committee that will be you know, the home to the High Commission on Human Rights. And so when she is there, she's giving speeches about the glory of the UN and really not doing a lot of work. And then the Security Council totally focuses on the bomb and ignores the refugee crisis. And it is the refugee crisis that pushes her into the declaration because she ends up having debate Vyshinsky and I want you to think of James Earl Jones with the cutthroat nature of, um, and the brutal honesty, um, and in his way, integrity of John McCain. I mean, a maverick in his own right, but was the singular best debater in the world. And the guys aren't ready to debate him, and so they turn to her, and she has to pick up a paper, piece of paper, and write four words down get her nails done, and then she goes back and she debates him. And in the process of that, it's the first time that Vyshinsky has been out debated on the floor of the United Nations. At which point, at this point, there are 51 members of the United Nations. 50 of them go to her and say, Mrs. Roosevelt, we want you to chair the commission, char the, the nuclear committee, charged with drafting the declaration. And she's very reluctant, but she's not a lawyer. And there, and you notice I left one nation out that was opposed to it. Anybody want to guess who that was? Us! We didn't want her. But she goes in, and after more than 3,300 hours of meetings over two years, dealing with a nuclear committee that is made up of 18 people who don't agree on God, don't agree on whether money exists, 
don't agree on marriage, don't agree on the role of children, don't agree on citizenship, don't agree on the world of government. The only thing they believe is, by God, we beat the Germans. And what she is able to do in that is to forge consensus and push the delegates to push their nations to come to an agreement. And she had to push the United States because we very much did not want economic, social, and cultural rights in the Declaration. This is the era of Jim Crow. Truman has not desegregated the military yet. The Democratic Party was the party of the South. You know, it was, in, in, and the Roosevelt Coalition is fracturing in 1948. You'll have a Dixiecrat candidate. You know, you're gonna have a Democratic candidate. You're gonna have a Republican candidate. You're gonna have a progressive candidate. And so there is no consensus. And through the force of her diligent reading and through her bedrock understanding and negotiating with the Soviets, negotiating with the British who were opposed to the Declaration, negotiating with um, Han Sameda from India, negotiating with folks from Australia, as well as us and the Soviet bloc to form consensus. And the consensus is that of course she must have political and civil rights. Of course she must have ac um, access to education. Of course you must have free speech. But the combination of the Great Depression and the war taught her a fundamental lesson that was driven home by her, but by the tasks, the onus tasks that the UN delegated her once she got to Europe. She was the first American who was non-military to go to the refugee camps and the Holocaust camps. She met with thousands and thousands of refugees. She got thousands of letters unsolicited every day about the plight of their lives and their fear for what is to come. And Eleanor turns to realize a fundamental thing, and that is that the focus on the bomb creates an aura of fear that says the wor World War III is right around the corner with the most heinous, unimaginable, despicable weapons the world has ever seen. World War II came 20 years after World War I. Now everybody is terrified that World War III is gonna be right around the corner with the bomb. And she says to a young student, who writes her, I have in a personal, confidential, not for publication letter, that I have learned what it is like in my own life to live a life that is defined by fear. When in reality, all we have to have is the courage to look ourselves in the mirror and take one step at a time. And so the declaration to her was a clarion call to the world to say, yes, there will be war, but we can mitigate war. Yes, there will be discrimination and hunger and violence and lack of education and instability but we can figure out how to manage that in a way that will make it decrease and give hope to the rest of the world. So the declaration to her was not just an antidote to the war, not just 
an antidote to the Great Depression. But a clarion call for all of us to reach down inside ourselves to envision a world and then risk ourselves to do it. And what do I mean by that? Now I have to say I come from a family of lawyers. My closest friends are lawyers. I brought my pal Michael Schiffer, a lawyer to the, I mean Michael Cooper, who's a lawyer to dinner tonight, okay? But the number one opponent of the Universal Declaration is the group that's in this room, was the American Bar Association. And so it was Eleanor Roosevelt who had to go around the country to debate the ABA, to get the ABA to stop saying that social and economic rights were in fact a socialist and communist plot. But that, in, I'm serious, but in fact were a fundamental ingredient of what the Democratic with the little d vision meant. So being in this room tonight, it's just phenomenal. It is so ironic, it is just, I'm standing in Sarah's spot with the ABA coming together to celebrate Eleanor's vision and her courage and her sheer pragmatic political prowess. Because I believe with every fiber of my being, and after 20 years of scholarship on this, that had Eleanor not agreed in 1947, that we needed to separate the covenants from the Declaration and separate the court from the Declaration, but pursue all three simultaneously, we would never have a Declaration. Because, and I'm quoting her, lawyers would spend three years debating where to put a comma. <laughs> and so Eleanor learned to talk law she learned to talk philosophy. She was a born diplomat. But she also understood how to make this vision accessible. And so my favorite example of her negotiating skills, after these 3,300 hours of negotiation, after, after getting it through all of the committees, after you know, getting it through ECOSOC and getting ready to go to the General <laughs> Assembly. What did she do? She went to every member of the United Nations staff, from the custodians to the cooking team to the secretariat to make sure that it resonated with them. Because if the vision wasn't clear and legally binding, the vision would fail. And I would argue that was the single most important contribution that she made to the Declaration when she forced Truman and Lovett over the threat of her re resignation to include social, economic, and cultural rights. And worked with Vashinsky not to object to the political and civil rights, that's how we got the Declaration. And so I think it is enormously fitting that the ABA named this award after her because she was a fierce negotiator, a woman who believed in the rule of law, a woman who risked her family, her reputation, her physical safety, and her income to see this through and then championed it until she died, and ultimately helped sway the ABA here. So thank you all very much for coming, and I'm profoundly grateful for your work. I appreciate everything done by the American Bar Association and uh, all of you here to arrange this meeting and to recall the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has been a landmark in 
expressing human aspirations for a better world. My own connection with that, which has been briefly mentioned, I believe, is that I became the chief prosecutor in one of the subsequent Nuremberg trials after the International Military Tribunal trial was already on. And I accused 22 high-ranking officers selected by me on the basis of their rank and their education. They were all either generals or very well educated, some with double doctorates. And I accused them of crimes against humanity. And for the first time, I used the word genocide, although it was not yet incorporated into the laws, to describe what they were doing. These were special extermination squads, Einsatzgruppen, Einsatz means action, groups. Their assignment was to follow behind the German lines and kill every single Jewish man, woman, and child they could lay their hands on, and do the same thing with gypsies, and do the same thing with any other suspected potential opponents of the Third Reich. And that's what they did. And being very Germanic, they recorded everything in reports, Ereignis Meldung aus der UdSSR, that's to show off my German, in English it is reports from the Eastern Front, and I had the name of the unit, the name of the commander, the number of people the report had killed, the name of the town, and that was marked top secret, forwarded to Berlin. Berlin it was consolidated into a loose leaf book. I had the distribution list of over 90 people to whom that was distributed, people who later said they knew nothing about it. I took a little adding machine and I added them up. When I reached 100, a million people murdered. That's a million people, that's more people than you've ever looked at. Uh, I took a sampling, I flew from Berlin where I had the headquarters to do the research, to Nuremberg. I presented that to my boss then, General Telford Taylor. Later we were law partners in New York. And I said, we've got to put on a new trial. He said, we can't. The lawyers have already been assigned. We've got 12 trials going. The Pentagon's not going to give us any more budgets for this. We can't put on a new trial. I said, it's impossible. I have in my hand mass murder on a scale never before seen in human history. You're not going to let these guys go. And he said, well, can you do it in addition to your other work? And I said, sure. He said, OK, you're it. So I became the chief prosecutor of the biggest murder trial in human history. It was my first case. I had never been in a courtroom. <laughs> it's true, I will confess. I got a scholarship from the Harvard Law School for my exam on criminal law. And I had been raised around here in the slums of New York. Uh, and I knew plenty of criminals. I didn't know any lawyers. <laughs> However, <laughs> with that background, I rested my case in two days. Marino Campo, eat your heart out. In two, <laughs> in two days, I rested my case and convicted all of them. And 13 of them were sentenced to death by a, three judges, American judges, led by Michael Musmano, who mm -hmm. was the Navy captain during the war, and uh, who was of Superior Court of Pennsylvania. Uh, and the important thing in connection with our human rights thinking I asked myself, what do you ask for for penalty? Here I've got these 22 guys, and this 20, ridiculous reason, 22, because there's only 22 seats. Sorry, kids, the seats are sold out. 22 seats, and I had 3,000 men listed, each one of them, beyond any doubt, mass murder, including thousands of children shot one shot at a time. What do you ask for? Well. I thought, I'm trying to do justice. How do you balance the scales of justice? You got a million people murdered, innocent people, who never committed any crimes. And then you got a handful of murderers, maybe more if you want to round them up. I said, there is no room for justice in a case like that. And if I could get a rule of law which would protect people, that might be more useful because the victims were murdered simply because they didn't share the race, the religion, or the ideology of their executioners. And I thought that was a horrible thing. 
And so I ask the court to affirm by international criminal law the right of all human beings to live in peace and dignity regardless of their race or creed. And the court agreed with me and sentenced 13 of them to death, but the rest of it was a principle of law. Uh, four were actually executed and came clemency actions. So that principle of law, which I tried to develop as a young, inexperienced kid at 27, has remained with me. Uh, I have no doubt that my own experience as a combat soldier in World War II, I landed on the beaches of Normandy, I went through the Maginot Line, I went through the Siegfried Line, I crossed the Rhine on a pontoon bridge driving a jeep, I was in the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, in addition to that, my last assignments in the war, they finally caught up with the fact that I could do more than be a typist or a jeep driver, uh, was to go into the concentration camps as they were being liberated, collect the evidence of the crimes so that they could have uh, trials against the offenders as had been promised by the Allied leaders before the war ended. And that experience of going into the camps hot with the, move, with the tank troops coming in, has sadly remained with me. Uh, it's hard, indescribable, uh, people groveling in the garbage for a bit of food, piled up skeletons waiting to be burned by the crematoria like cordwood, uh, and uh, digging up American bodies who had been shot down by, uh, uh, by over German-held territory and had been murdered by the German mob on the ground and dumped in a ditch somewhere. Uh, I personally did all those things. When the war was over, I had the rank of sergeant of infantry. But I told the colonel, look, just get out of my way. I don't wear any insignia. I'll get the job done, and I did. I went home looking for a job. Suddenly I got a telegram from the Pentagon, Dear Sir, they never called me Sir before. <laughs> <laughs> Please come to Washington, dear Sir. We said we'd like you to go back. Go back where? To Germany? I said, if you get me back to Germany, you're gonna have to declare war on Germany again and be losing. <laughs> anyway, there I was, uh, assigned to go into the camps, collect the evidence. After that, I stayed on to set up the restitution program. There's very little is known about that. Well, not all, all victims, uh, not only Jewish victims, but any victim of uh, Nazi crimes. Compensation it was a principle I learned in the first year in law school. Uh, if you do a harm to someone, you have an obligation to try to make good. If you can't make good financially or otherwise, you, that you have to try to do. So that's the background from which I come in the field of human rights. Human rights is not just an expression for me. Uh, I've seen what happens if you ignore the respect that is due to every human being, regardless of his color or his creed. And that has become a firm principle of my life and everything that I've done. And I know that we have the capacity today from cyberspace to cut off the electrical grid on planet Earth, which means we can kill everybody. Killing Washington, New York, that's easy, on the whole planet. We now have that capacity. The Russians have it too. So have Chinese. It's a big secret. It was told to me in very great confidence about 15 years ago in a conference I had in St. Petersburg, Russia. So the young people, and I meet them very often, are prize of the danger to them. No danger to me, I'm 99, nobody can touch me. Nobody pays me, nobody hired me, I'm not to hire. I call the shots as I see them. Uh, and I tell the young people, your lives are at stake. Kids, don't take it. Uh, I get standing ovation. Don't tell me the United States is against the court because the kids are for the court. It's quite rational. If somebody's accused of crimes, he's entitled to go to a court, be presumed innocent, get a fair trial, and get the punishment that belongs to the crime. That's the system we tried to set up, and it's a system we have going with all of its problems, and I'm aware of all of the problems. 
and they're difficult. It's like the Wright brothers saying that put a wing on a bicycle and it'll fly. Well, it didn't fly, but eventually it worked. And we've got problems with the court. It's something new, and it's expensive, and it's hard to get the witnesses, and it's hard to arrest the criminals because they're the heads of state, and there's immunity, and there are a lot of problems wrong with it. But we've got the court, and it's working. And uh, it may look like it's illegal or undesirable to Mr. John Bolton, but how does it look to you? You're a bar association, human rights group. I'm proud to be associated with it. You're calling together these people who are dedicated to making it a more humane world. Don't stop now. Keep going. Now, now let me just say that as divided as our politics are today, um, I, I want to remind all of us about what Eleanor Roosevelt faced when she was tasked with the responsibility of overseeing uh, a group of uh, representatives of nations to draft a Declaration of Human Rights. The 18 nations involved agreed on practically nothing. They disagreed on whether God exists, on citizenship, on marriage, on whether childhood as an entity existed under the law, on the purpose of government. They disagreed on what was meant by terms like freedom and democracy. So it's nothing new that we have disagreements. Um, but it was clear that she had her work cut out for her. And through it all, and when I say I really mean through it all, because she faced death threats uh, for her outspoken advocacy. Mm -hmm. She faced fierce opposition from adversaries as well as allies. And she had, uh, as Tracy said, she had traveled the world uh, during World War II. Uh, she did it uh, as an extension of her continuing role as President Roosevelt's uh, eyes and ears, uh, going places he could not go. Uh, and she would report back. And what she saw was incredibly impactful on her. And she recognized how easy it would be following such a horrific event in human history for nations to turn inward, to give in to fear, to adopt a kind of Darwinian attitude toward politics, being governed by despair. And she understood on a level that I think few could have that everything needed to be done that could be done to prevent that from happening. She believed that, as Ben said, the best way to prevent war was to come together around a vision that could stop atrocities before they happened, to protect the inherent human dignity of all people. So she spent thousands of hours. And these were heartfelt, difficult debates, because what did human rights mean? How could they be put on paper? How could they be enforced? And yet she pushed them. She pushed the committee day after day, late into the night. And so intense was her focus that some of her fellow delegates probably uttered the prayer that has been attributed to President Roosevelt, oh Lord, make Eleanor tired. <laughs> But in the end, after nearly two years of debating and drafting, and actually one last long night of debate, the United Nations ratified the final text, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. It has a very, very simple idea underlying it that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity that human rights are the birthright of all people, not merely the sufferance of their governments. 
and that our rights stem from our common humanity and that governments are bound to respect those rights. Now, in the nearly 70 years since the Declaration was adopted, I think it is fair to say that many nations have made progress in making human rights a reality. A lot of barriers have fallen that stood in the way of enjoying the full measure of liberty and the experience of dignity and the benefits of humanity. Now, in most instances, that progress was not easily won. People had to fight and organize and campaign to change not only laws, but hearts and minds. And as for Eleanor, she dedicated the last 17 years of her life to the Declaration's vision of a world striving toward peace and justice, often risking her reputation, her income, and even her physical safety. She's shown a light on human rights abuses, not only elsewhere in the world, but here at home, particularly on racial segregation, the position of women, and the treatment of immigrants. She had a lofty, heartfelt vision of what democracy was supposed to mean. Well, we know where we are now. Uh, it took a long time to get to this point, but it is fair to say that other presidents prior to our current uh, administration continued Eleanor's work. George W. Bush's administration adopted the Conventions on the Prevention of Genocide and the Protection of Civil and Political Rights. The Clinton administration, in addition to signing uh, the uh, International Criminal Court Convention, uh, ratified conventions committing us to end racial discrimination and torture. And in the Obama administration, during my tenure as Secretary of State, we finally included our own country in the department's annual report on human rights and addressed internet freedom, human trafficking, global women's issues, and LGBTQ rights. So where are we today? Well, we still have laws on the books, as many of you know, like the Foreign Assistance Act, which denies foreign aid to human rights violators, the Leahy Law, which prevents US military aid from going to foreign military units that commit heinous human rights violations. Victims of torture can now sue their violators, providing not only legal recourse, but often the only formal recognition they receive of the horrors that they endured. The War Crimes Act allows criminal prosecution of war criminals, and President Obama stopped enhanced interrogation techniques. But we are living at a moment of global tumult that rivals what Eleanor faced years ago, and it's a little difficult to understand exactly why. People in the world have never had greater prosperity, greater freedom, greater opportunities, and yet there is something at work in those hearts and minds of people in so many places that have led them to begin breaking into small groups, some call it tribalization, but to begin to define themselves not as who they are, but against who someone else is. So I will have to underscore my strong belief that voices like all of yours and voices like Ben's are more needed today to remind us, to bring us back to the recognition of who we are at our best selves, the importance of the rule of law in protecting not only somebody else, but eventually ourselves. To reinforce the fundamental American ideal of equal rights under the law. And there is no better group than those of you in this room. So I would hope that 
as the ABA continues the work of the center, and I remember Jerry Shestak lobbying everyone endlessly <laughs> to do more on human rights. He was inescapable. It did not matter where you were, he would find you. And we have to do more to continue to move forward on this agenda, even beyond what the ABA and the center are already doing. Because what we're seeing is, unfortunately, a concerted effort against human rights. Not only the human rights of immigrants and refugees, but an understanding of the human rights of free expression, of free assembly, of due process, of, yes, at the very bottom, the rule of law. So we should ask ourselves what legal and political actions are most effective in not only defending human rights, but defending the defenders. I think we're up to the task of pushing back and of creating more space so that more Americans recognize what is at stake. But I also know that we have to deal with underlying political fears and insecurities. Um, we have to stand up against the concerted attacks on our institutions. Uh, and we have to defend the rule of law. So let us follow Eleanor Roosevelt's advice as we move forward. Uh, there are so many quotes from Eleanor. This is one that uh, I did not know before uh, Alita sent it to me. Courage is more exhilarating than fear, and in the long run, it is easier. <laughs> so if we remember what Eleanor achieved at a time of enormous fear, concern, exhaustion, we certainly can do our part today. We do not have to become heroes overnight, she said, just a step at a time, meeting each thing that comes up, seeing it is not as dreadful as it appeared, discovering we have the strength to stare it down. So thank you so much for this honor, but more than that, thank you so much for what each and every one of you, as well as the ABA, continues to do. We've never needed you more. Thank you.